Good morning. So I really tore it up in the gym yesterday, and that means that I'm going to treat myself to a nice high-protein breakfast here. I just got a steak thawing in the sink, and for some reason having a steak for breakfast feels really excessive to me, but, uh, but somehow it seems more excessive in my mind than the thing that I would have done instead, which is like go with Lauren out to a restaurant where I would order steak and eggs. That somehow feels like less indulgent to me. That makes absolutely no sense. This is far more efficient for me to just make the uh, steak at home. And uh, hey, I've earned it. I'm a growing boy. I mean, obviously not vertically or what they call a linear height. That's how scientists refer to that dimension of growth, right? Growing up instead of out. This is going to help me uh, grow out. I mean, hopefully to grow out here and here, not, you know, here, but, you know, odds are <laughs> it's probably going to make me grow in all dimensions, uh, horizontal dimensions. But diet absolutely does affect how tall you grow in your developmental years of life. Uh, just not kind of in the way that sometimes people talk about it. Like there's this YouTuber who's been around for years, I like him a lot, named uh, Lindy Beige, and he did a video early in his career. I mean, he was very much like a hot take artist early in his career in the same way that I was and has some videos that he'd probably like to take back. I mean, I imagine I'd like to take back some of my early hot takes, which even though I might have basically believed in the central thrust of them, it's just not a productive way to make an argument. And you can see that once you get sort of famous on the internet and you see how your negativity multiplies like a virus across the internet and it's kind of horrifying. And so you stop doing hot takes as much as possible, or at least I have. Anyway, Lindy Beige in one of his very early videos was talking about like pro-tall people bias, which is a real thing. Lots of sociological literature looking at it that people who are taller tend to get promoted to higher positions, make more money, do better in love and life and everything, right? And Lindy Beige, because he likes kind of being a contrarian, was trying to get people to think about why that might be the case. And what he pointed out, which I do think is essentially true, is that um, there's good reasons why we favor people who are taller, because usually, or at least historically over the course of human history, um, taller people really have been better. <laughs> Pop-Tart says, what'd you say? What did you say? Human height is actually one of the oldest subjects of human study, right? Because um, it was studied as part of military recruiting going back hundreds of years, uh, where you know, conscripting troops from different areas of your country, you notice that some of them are taller from here and therefore might be better fighters or at least uh, better fighters for certain tasks. Everybody knows that small guys absolutely have functions in any kind of field of combat, right? But all things being equal, taller or bigger is usually better in fighting, I think but usually all things aren't equal, so there's a job on the team for everybody. Let's see where we're at. Oh yeah, that's hot enough. You wanna see the dancing bubbles? I believe that's called the uh, Leiden frost effect, something like that, when water is so hot that it just kind of bounces around like that. Anyway, what the research clearly shows is that the chief determiner of your height is genetics, different populations of the world adapted to their environments by growing to different kinds of height. Generally speaking, cold weather tends to favor bigger bodies in all animals, but there's a million exceptions to that. And now we have even tall populations like the Nilotic people of East Africa who are super tall, but in their case, it might even be an adaptation to the heat because they're super tall and skinny, which allows them to like shed a whole bunch of heat into the environment, it's, it's a whole thing. But uh, regardless, how tall you are is chiefly a matter of who your parents were. But another big determiner of how tall you're gonna grow is um, what kind of childhood you have and how healthy your household is. So that's both in terms of like, how much are you getting sick? How, what kind of diseases do you get? But also how well do you eat, right? I mean, to stay with the former for a second, you may have heard that like mainstream beef in the United States, the cattle are given antibiotics even when they don't need them. And that's true in a lot of cases, at least. Reason is that it makes them grow bigger and faster. And no one knows exactly why antibiotics make animals grow bigger and faster. But one obvious hypothesis is that uh, if the body is relieved from the responsibility of defending itself against infections, it can take some of that energy and put it into other things like growth. This is just a breakfast steak, so I'm not gonna do much to it. Point is, kids who are sick a lot when they're growing uh, tend to get their growth stunted, probably because their body is having to put its resources into getting healthy instead of growing taller. Another thing that makes kids grow shorter than they otherwise could or should have is if they don't get enough to eat when they're growing up or if their mothers don't get enough to eat or get sick when they're pregnant, right? There we go. Like I said, it's just you know a high protein breakfast. I don't wanna drench it in butter. I mean, I definitely want to drench it in butter, I'm just not going to. Anyway, it is definitely true 
that people who don't eat well when they're growing up tend to grow less than their potential linearly. And on that basis, this history YouTuber I like, Lindy Beige, argued many, many years ago, and I think probably wouldn't put it this way again today, that uh, there's a good reason why we have this stereotype that tall people are better. It's because people who are tall are coming from better family situations and have been raised better in objectively better ways. I mean, I don't like to think or talk in those ways very often, but we can agree, right, that there's some things that are objectively better, like having enough food to eat, right? That's just better. And all things being equal, it's usually better objectively to have more money as opposed to less, right? And getting more money is exactly what uh, Rocket Money is all about, sponsor of this video. Not really getting money, but uh, helping you keep more of the money that you make. You can get started for free right now at rocketmoney.com slash Adam Ragusea. That link is in the description. Your viewership has put me in a very secure financial situation, and I appreciate that, but I am not immune to one of the great personal finance scourges of our day. Scourge? Scourge. Don't know how to pronounce that. But the scourge, scourge? She says scourge. Okay, the scourge is just that we have to sign up for 80 million things with our bank account information these days, and as a result, we end up accumulating all of these random little recurring charges that can really eat away at what you're taking home. Rocket Money is this app that you can allow to monitor your bank accounts for you. Every time there's like a big transaction from my bank account, I get an email warning me that something might be up, which I really appreciate. But my favorite thing is how it goes in and it analyzes all of my transactions and finds these monthly charges that I didn't even realize that I had. Like I had this stupid, um, well, it was a car wash subscription that I just couldn't actually use the way it was set up. And so I just asked Rocket Money to cancel it for me and they did. Ah. Rocket Money can also try to renegotiate your bills for you. You know, lots of companies will do that. All right, come on, dog. <clears throat> Rocket Money has helped its users save more than $500 million just through canceling subscriptions. And their tools can analyze your spending, help you set a budget. Just sign up for free right now at rocketmoney.com slash Adam Ragusea. Get started for free with my link in the description. Thank you, Rocket Money. Anyway, yes, it's true. There's a million studies showing that the better your diet is when you're a child, you will grow taller or more to your genetic potential. Up to a point, right? This is really, really important. Back in the days where probably Lindy Beige is more familiar, which is kind of medieval European history, back then a peasant's bad diet was way worse than a poor person's bad diet nowadays in a rich country, at least, like the United States. Mm. I mean, if you were like an early modern period Swedish soldier from some rural corner of Sweden who was being conscripted into service and that's why your height and weight was being recorded, you can go back and you can look at like the famine that that guy's village suffered and you can see that absolutely everybody from there seemed to come out a little bit shorter. But what are they experiencing at that time? It's not, you know, having slightly lower quality beef. Uh, it's eating only bread or sometimes not bread at all, usually famine, literally like famine, going through periods of actual starvation that you survive when you're a child, but you are diminished by it and you are not able to grow to your full potential. That's what we're talking about, right? You want some? There you go. Very well-fed peasant. And this is actually one of the things that makes like pre-modern history make a lot more sense to me. Actually, there's two things that make it make a lot more sense to me. One is to remember how ridiculously young everyone was. Like we're just much older as a species now than we used to be. And so when you see that like, oh yeah, that king was 18 years old, of course he made that ridiculous rash decision. Yeah, that just makes a lot more sense in the world. The other thing that makes history, pre-modern history make more sense to me is to remember that the, um, the elite, the nobility, they really would have seemed in many cases like superior beings to the peasantry, right? Because they were the only people who got decent meat on a regular basis when they were uh, growing up. Sorry for the vegans, it doesn't have to be meat. You can absolutely grow to your full potential on any kind of diet as long as it meets all of your basic nutritional needs and you can do that with a vegan diet, no doubt. But anyways, just in, sorry. Anyway. I mean, there's cognitive development stuff, too, that can be stunted, in effect, through uh, early childhood nutrition problems and disease and stuff like that. So the, the, the nobility, which would have been the only people who got any of the good medical care and food in this society, yeah, it's reasonable to think that they would have just been taller and, like, fairer, you know, more had more of their teeth and maybe even, like, smarter. I mean, they also got the only education in town. So, yeah, the lord of the manor and his shithead sons might indeed have come across as kind of superior beings to whom you should owe your allegiance. It makes things make a little bit more sense to me. Here, you want some of this? I ate the part that I rubbed garlic on, so it should be safe for you. There you go. But what about nowadays, right? 
do poor kids nowadays grow up less tall than their peers? And therefore, could height really be a meaningful proxy for sort of success of how a person was raised, at least physically? The answer, according to a number of studies, is no, at least not in rich countries like the United States, developed countries where there basically is enough food for everyone. When someone doesn't have enough food, it's a social problem, it's a political pro problem rather than an agricultural or an economic problem. In countries like that, where people don't really experience famine, what they experience more is what they call food insecurity, right? Um, food insecurity is in no way correlated with differences in linear height in rich countries, according to study after study, except in like the most at-risk populations, people who really have everything else going against them in terms of their socioeconomic status and all of that. Now, if you leave the world of rich countries, like here, this is a study of uh, adolescents in southwest Ethiopia, and in this case, they found that what they defined as food insecurity among this population of kids absolutely did stunt their growth a little bit. Now, food insecurity in rich countries is correlated with all kinds of other bad things, just not stunting of growth. We simply don't go hungry enough in the United States and countries like it for people's height to be affected by their socioeconomic status. That's what most of the research seems to indicate. I mean, there are some other data points, like there's this study, which you might have seen reported as having said that children who grew up in um, the austerity era of the UK, that is the present era of budget cuts in the UK government, there's a study that found that kids who were growing up in the UK during those years have been uh, growing not as tall as well, as what? <laughs> That's where the rub is with this study. It really actually did not indicate that uh, those people were not growing tall. It actually indicated it's just that um, the Brits are not quite as tall as they are relative to everybody else in the world, mostly because everybody else in the world has been getting taller, because everybody else in the world has been getting healthier and better fed. That's mostly what's going on here, I think. And it seems to be the same basic deal with like medical care, rich countries, kids get enough medical care, even if it's not enough medical care, they get enough medical care that they tend to grow to their adult potential. Uh, also, we see like COVID-19, getting sick uh, as a kid can certainly affect you in a lot of ways, but with Japanese kids, it just made them fatter, not shorter. Uh, it might've been the uh, lockdowns. So here's what I take away from that. It seems that in developed countries, at least nowadays, height cannot be taken as a proxy for the success of your breeding line or the success of your family or anything like that, right? Poverty in developed countries is real and poverty sucks, but almost everybody in developed countries nowadays gets enough food and medical care to reach their biological potential for height. Comparable data on canine populations was not immediately forthcoming, Pop-Tart, sorry. So this is why stereotypes are bad, right? Stereotypes are often based upon like real things that tell you real and useful information about real people at some point in their history. But then history advances and circumstances change, right? Like seeing a tall nobleman in the 12th century or whatever might have been a good indication that, that guy was raised well in the conventional sense, had enough food and water and medical care and sanitation and all of that. But nowadays, in the countries where most of you live, according to my analytics, that just isn't really true anymore. Oh, look at this crayfish. And that's a meaningful distinction, Pop-Tart, because it probably leads people who are kind of worthy of opportunities being denied those opportunities in favor of some taller asshole who's gonna suck. Okay, so here's a funny story about that. I said in a video recently that I'm five foot eight inches tall, which apparently, I guess I'm a little bit taller than that. Here you go. Thank you. You're about five, nine and a half. What? There's no way. I don't trust that. I'm going to get it done at the doctor with the thing, you know, the thing. I said on the internet that I'm 5'8", five, 5'9", five, something like that, and then I got a lot of people commenting calling me a short king, which I, I appreciate the king part, but like, short is just not apt, right? Like, I am literally average. 5'8", five, 5'9", five, that is the global average for an adult male height. Um, I might be actually a little bit taller than the global average, maybe a little bit shorter than the national average here in the United States, because people in the US are on average just a little bit higher, but like, my height could not be any less remarkable, right? It is as normal as it gets. It's just, it, it is not worth commenting on. Ha <laughs> ha! I mean, unless you just expected me to be taller. I mean, that's perfectly reasonable. You might have thought that I had, like, tall guy energy. I don't really know what that is. But, like, the only reason that we think of 5'8", five, 5'9", five, as being short instead of average is because we're sort of weighting the average in our minds, right? Because we value tall people more than we value short people. Therefore, to be a person of full worth in this world, you can't just be tall enough. You can't just be of average height. You need to be of unusual height. That's kind of messed up.
I mean, mass media and then the internet has just been destroying our brains in that regard and making us confuse the extraordinary for the ordinary, right? Because the extra, come here, because the extraordinary, come here, I'm holding the beef for you, come here, come here and get in the shot. Thank you. Because the extraordinary uh, is, is what actually like works on like vertical video, right? So we're just looking at incredible people, incredible specimens in all kinds of ways all the time. And that, and that just causes us to lose perspective. We forget that these are extraordinary people, not ordinary people. Like when I did a collaboration with uh, Renaissance Periodization RP, Dr. Mike, the fitness channel here on YouTube, did a workout. And then like, you know, a lot of people in the comments were very complimentary. They said, oh, Adam, you know, looks pretty good. Or <laughs> if Adam just cut some weight and he'd, he'd look really good, right? But then there was this one guy who just typed um, least athletic body on YouTube. And it's like, dude, it's not just that I, I mean, part of me finds that personally insulting, I'll admit, but like, whatever, that's not the problem. The problem is just that indicates how completely warped your expectations are, right? Like, if you think this is the least athletic body on YouTube, you have not watched a whole lot of videos. It's just a normal body. It's a totally freaking normal body. Normal in every conceivable way. And that shouldn't be remarkable. It should be the opposite of remarkable, right? And you may not care at all about my feelings, and that's perfectly fine, but think about yours. If you have unrealistic expectations for me, you're gonna have unrealistic expectations for yourself, and that's not gonna end well for you. I think that's the end of the video.